and welcome to the very first RI Science Podcast. Every two weeks, we will be bringing you one of our public lectures previously recorded at the RI. These will take a close look at everything from consciousness, gravitational waves, the mathematics of gambling, to race, racism and genetics. First up, we have Ben Miller and Jim Al-Khalili discussing aliens, where to find them and the origins of life on Earth. For me, what's really exciting is joining together two sides of my life, is joining together yeah. the comedy that I love and trying to make science funny. I mean, and that comes with across. varying degrees of success. <laughs> no, I mean, it's certainly in this book. I mean, it, it is incredibly amusing. I mean, it's some... And, and, okay, it's a sort of subject that lends itself to, you know, yeah. sort of people who think they've, they've, they've seen aliens and UFO <laughs> abductions and all that. They're, they are easy targets. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the book is full of these anecdotes or, you know, weird and wacky uh, experiments yeah. about the nature of life and, and the search for life elsewhere. Some, some, I, some I knew about and others I, that, that were, were really new to me. And the aliens, the title, Aliens Are Coming. So the notion isn't just what do aliens look like or what are, what's the probability but it goes back to what, what is life and, how yeah. life and how likely was life to have started on Earth and therefore could it start elsewhere. And, and all the, the search, you know, you can you wait for signals to come or do you look for extrasolar planets. And there's a lot happening at the moment in science. It's extraordinary. Um, so yeah. the book sort of starts out really telling that story with the first, with the early exploration that we made of the solar system, you know, when we're sending our probes to Venus and to Mars and then beyond to some of the giant planets, how barren everything looked and mm. how it looked like the Earth seemed to be the only place where life could possibly... The Goldilocks flourish. Planet, yeah, you know, this cool, place that it? was just, just right. so perfect, where everything was just so right. And how slowly uh, that picture's changed until there's a, there's a positive... Uh, you, you may not be aware of it, but there's a, a positive fever in the cosmological community at the moment. We're just at the brink of the stage where we are going to be able to... We already can look at the spectra of, uh, of uh, planets orbiting nearby stars, and soon we're going to have more and more telescopes that can give us even more information, not only about are there... To begin with, are there large planets orbiting sun-like stars near us, and what are their atmospheres like? We'll be able to I mean, look. That's, that's incredible, isn't it? The, Amazing. That you can figure out the... the, the what their atmospheres, if they have an atmosphere or not, just from the spectroscopy, from yeah. the light that comes and, and, and the lines in the, the You read the off the barcode, bar basically. Thing. Okay, so it's got a bit of oxygen, it's yeah. got this, it's got nitrogen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, therefore... No oxygen there. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no oxygen there. Yeah. <laughs> Intelligent aliens. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's just... Uh, <laughs> and and, and so, so there's that search, looking for planets that might be habitable, and then yeah. there's also the, you know, the SETI... Uh, the, the search that's waiting for signals to come from s alien civilizations. I know, and a lot of people may be surprised to, kn to know this, but, you know, they're bona fide, peer-reviewed, hard-working cosmologists who are, who are doing incredibly important work. Um, and the task is enormous, because if you can say, well, we're going to find, we're going to try and find signs of intelligent life in the universe. The question is, you've got an enormous haystack there that you've got mm. to look for a needle in. What, you don't even know what kind of needle you're looking for. You don't even know what the signal is. So at least the debate has begun through SETI. The debate has yeah. begun of what we should look for and um, how we might recognise it if we find it. Which we haven't yet. I mean, despite... The one third of Americans who, who claim to have been abducted. I, mean, I made that statistic up, and, and it's, it's unfair on, on Americans because I'm sure there are lots of people. Around. But you know, the, the number of people who think they've seen aliens and UFOs and so on, and yet you know, the most dedicated searches for any sort of signal that looks like it might have been you know, some, some alien, some intelligence has, has, has created it, has, has, has come Apart up with nothing. Apart from so this one result, which I, I'm very fond of, which is this. Uh, this uh, wow signal, right. um, which is a fascinating little story. This guy, Jerry Ehrman, uh, operating the, what was the Big Ear radio telescope in Ohio. Uh, basically, they'd closed down the telescope, they cut off the funding, and he was uh, sort of moonlighting, really. He was working, I think, in a business school, uh, retraining, basically. And uh, he was still getting the data sent through to him at night. And 
most of the stuff, when you point a radio telescope at the sky, mostly, most things give off a big splurge of radiation at all kinds of different wavelengths. There are one or two objects that give off very specific frequencies, things like pulsars, but most stuff just splurges stuff out across a really wide range of um, colours, if you like, of the spectrum. And artificial signals on Earth tend to have, be focused around a very narrow range of frequencies. And he picked up, put it this way, if he pointed his telescope at, at an artificial signal, this is what it would have looked like. Unfortunately, they listened for another sort of 60 days or something, the exact same patch of sky, never heard anything else. And because this is science, you know, this isn't UFOs, this is science, that's counted as a null result, a, a null result. but nevertheless... Something, something did happen that is not explained simply by, you know, something straightforward like a uh, reflected artificial signal or, you know, something from Earth that then got reflected back into the telescope. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that doesn't mean he found a signal. It doesn't mean he didn't. It's just kind of... I just find it interesting. It's not quite, to, it's quite true to say we've never picked up anything. We did. We picked up something yeah. once, but we didn't pick it up again. It hasn't gone away. It's yeah, still yeah, there. yeah. That's I mean, because you know, a lot, a lot of people say, "Oh, well, you know, maybe you know, scientists, NASA, or whoever, or the, or the Pentagon, they know they've picked up signals, or they've picked up um, aliens have landed." But obviously, the conspiracy theorists would say, "You know, there's, they're keeping it quiet. You know, it's for our own good." Yeah. I want could, show of hands. How many people believe aliens have visited Earth? I'm not expecting to see many because you're all. Oh, look, there's one, two. <laughs> no, no, <I'm> <laughs> I'm not going to pick you out and, and you know, the objects are sort of ridicule. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's interesting because, I mean, I'm, may, maybe it's a smaller fraction of you know, audiences who come to the Royal Institution. I like to think my audiences uh, <laughs> are of a slightly different calibre. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but I, the, the, I, I love the story in the book where you, 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 you trace back the history of Flying saucers. Yeah. And it goes back to this guy, Kenneth Arnold. Kenneth Arnold, 1947 yeah. or something. That's right, yeah. This is an absolutely fascinating story. And, I mean, I think with... I do deal with uh, UFOs in the book. I'm fine. I love UFO stories, by the way. I mean, they're absolutely fantastic. And I enjoy them in the same way that I enjoy a good ghost story. They're sort of... Mm. They're absolutely um, riveting, I think. And always you have... The always the central ingredient in any good UFO story is a really reliable, upstanding citizen. Yes. <laughs> um, never had a drink. Yeah, you know, never had a drink. Or any you know, mental problems. Total, <laughs> totally steady. He's a bank manager or whatever he is. And he has this, he meets this alien or receives this signal. Um, and I, I love these stories. So they begin, I mean, they begin much earlier. You know, we have, we have um, Lovell uh, believing he sees uh, canals on the moon. Mm. I think sort of probably since the very beginnings of mankind, we've imagined that there were mm. creatures out there. Um, but really interestingly, the, the flying saucer phenomenon is fascinating because when you investigate the story, and I, I can promise you I've done it so you don't have to, um, <laughs> because it made my brain bleed. Um, it's really trying to find facts and narrow a story down. Um, but I got there in the end going back to original sources and original interviews. So the story is this. Um, this guy... Uh, sorry, did I, did I mention I'm an artificial intelligence and that was my... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a proxy sent here. Um, uh, <laughs> I need to reboot myself in a minute. Oh, um, so this guy, um, Kenneth Arnold, um, a uh, pilot, he actually had a sort of commercial business, but he flew uh, professionally, so he'd be flying all over, servicing sort of various companies with this uh, equipment. He was uh, flying in, uh, near Mount Rainier in Washington, and he saw, he believed he saw some sort of boomerang-shaped ships. And being a pilot, he made very accurate observations of how fast they were going and their exact shape and he drew them for when he, when he sort of uh, returned to the airport, he told the friends about this, and in came some colleagues from the same airport, and they said, oh, there's a military base nearby, you might see military planes, but he felt that they weren't military planes. And the story went out on the wire and was picked up by a press association 
who got it complete, who misquoted him, saying that he'd seen a saucer-shaped object. So first of all, he didn't see a saucer-shaped object. He saw, I mean, he saw something that looked a bit like, if he was reading aviation magazines at the time, which you would mm -hmm. assume he would, you can find aviation magazines with this thing called the, it was called a flying wing. It was a design for, that's very similar to what he's describing. Um, and uh, yet it went out on the, um, on the wire that he'd seen flying saucer, and immediately you have many reports of people seeing flying saucers, exactly not as he had seen them and described them, but as they were described in the <laughs> newspaper article. Amazing. <laughs> and this is, um, this is a fascinating thing about the... Uh, and it goes right to the heart of why we need to do science in the first place. But... Um, this needs answering. You, you read his account, and you can be pretty sure that he, he, he saw what he, he believed he saw what he saw. Uh, psychologists call it priming. You know, you obviously see, you know, you see an image of something, and then you might believe at some later point that you saw it yourself. He was possibly primed by some aviation magazine that he'd seen to believe he'd seen a flying wing. People who were reading the newspaper were primed by the newspaper to believe. The, someone had seen a flying saucer, and then they begin, they begin seeing flying saucers. And then you have all these other incidents that follow. In 1947, there's a wave of sightings in the US, all of people seeing flying saucers and documenting them and drawing them. And, and something's going on. I mean, I, I don't think that the, that thing is aliens suddenly change the design of their spaceships. <laughs> I mean, I think, but um, it's possible. Uh, but, you know, we have to think, well, how could that happen? You know, why, why do we see things that aren't there? And, of course, it comes down to the fact that this is brilliant. Uh, there's a brilliant Oliver Sacks quote that I found that I will now mangle, but it was something like, um, you know, every, uh, every act of memory is an act of invention and every act of perception is an act of creation. Something we're becoming more and more conscious of in psychology, we play an absolutely vital role in what we believe we see. You know, most of what you see in this room now is simply a, a, a projection, um, what your brain is expecting to see. Your brain isn't constantly sampling everything in your vision. It's basically looking at one or two objects and just, just filling in everything else. We left 10 minutes ago. Yeah, we're not hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> We have a hard time admitting that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. You know, we have a hard time admitting that we are imaginative creatures, that we're creatures of imagination. You know, but uh, well, the same goes for anything in the supernatural, ghosts and things like that. You know, you no, ghosts are real, Jim. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crop circles died a death very quickly. They didn't. Crop once circles owned are great. Up to it. Well, <laughs> that's unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, with crop circles, there were. It w there were a small number of perpetrators, and they, <laughs> and they actually just said, put their hand up, didn't they, at so, some yeah, point, saying, yeah. God, I mean, this is all getting out of hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. We did it. We've been making the crop circles. It's really not difficult. Look, we'll show um, you. I'll do one now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and they did. They sort of say, and this is how we do it. It's really not complicated. We just squash the... Because at the moment, there, was, uh, there were scientists sort of saying, you know, these fractal patterns could only be made yeah, by yeah, another intelligence, and, you know... You know um, yeah. yeah, but you, you, you get it in, into the heart of the book and you really get stuck into the science and you're talking about yeah. um, in an accessible way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to scare people. But, but um, in terms of just the, the, the sheer, you know, the chances of life having emerged on Earth even, just yes. once. We know life has emerged at least once here on Earth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what needs to come together for life to emerge? What is it, what's that magical, if indeed there is any magical jump between chemistry and, and biology. And this is another reason why I think this subject has sort of ignited, you know, for younger members of the audience, you know, sort of to keep harking back to, you know, 20 years ago when I started science, but really all we had, all we were given then was this sort of um, shallow pond idea, you know, this idea that, well, probably there was a pond and probably a lot of it evaporated, so it got quite concentrated, there's a lot of molecules in there, and sooner or later a molecule was created that could reproduce itself, and that's how life got started. That is vulnerable to a very clear argument, which was made by uh, a fantastic astronomer called Fred Hoyle, who, um, who said, well, you know, that is like uh, assuming that a wind can blow through a junkyard and spontaneously assemble a 747. You know, that's, 
life is too complicated for it to happen by chance. Just by chance, yeah. And I have to put my hand up here and say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not going to give you an unbiased view at this point, because having done a survey of all the different theories that are out there, the one that absolutely rang true to me, and maybe it's because I'm a physicist at heart, it's a, an argument that began um, with a physicist called Mike Russell and... Uh, Nick Lane, uh, a, an evolutionary biochemist here in the UK, has, has run with it as well and done, done a lot of work on it. It's basically, it's, all you need is rock, uh, water and carbon dioxide. So you, it's, life is basically a volcanic effect, is essentially what it comes down to. We need a source of energy. The problem with a pond is life, life uses energy in a, in a unique way. You know, it takes... Um, we, one thing you can generalise about all life forms is they consume some form of energy and, and give out heat. And how could a pond do that? Where's the source of energy? You know, if you've got a f one of the ideas was well, it's a flash of lightning or a bolt of lightning supplies that initial spark that generates the first molecule. But life isn't like that. Life appears to need a sustained source of energy, and that's what you have in a volcanic vent. Uh, you know, different evolutionary biochemists have slightly different theories, but the, in a nutshell, uh, it's basically that if you have acidic seawater, as you did in the early Earth, and you have alkaline water coming from a volcanic vent on the seafloor, you get a, a barrier um, where you have a, a charge difference, and that charge difference can be used as a source of energy. I mean, it's like a battery. or it, it, Essentially, that energy is on tap to drive the formation of longer chain molecules, sorry, I should say. And that's the kind of stuff that we're made of. And I love this energy approach to life. And that's what, that's what I found does, the does, most fascinating thing, a, a bit of uh, biology that I came across in the book. Does know. that answer Hoyle's issue, you know, that the improbable structure of the very first replicating molecule that can make a copy of itself. You can have all the ingredients. You know, I mean, um, mm. Miller and Ure did the famous experiment yes. in the 50s where they got all those, you know, the, the, instead of the bolt of lightning, they had, you know, the sort of the electrodes like Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. They had all yeah. the chemicals in a test tube, stir it up, and they got those building blocks, the mm. amino acids. But I guess it's putting them in the right arrangement that is what is so hard to do. Yeah. Exactly, and I think, the sh I think the honest answer would be no. It doesn't completely answer it. You know, until somebody has managed to make a self-reproducing molecule mm. through some kind of electrochemical cell, no, it hasn't been done. But the advantage that it has over the small, warm pond, mm. um, it, you can do it in stages. You don't have to do it all in one yeah. go. This is the really important thing. Nobody really knows what came first. You know, does the, it's the chicken and egg, really. Does the membrane come first? Do um, self-reproducing molecules come first? Does something else come first? At some point, you need all of them. Mm. And those ingredients are all there in hydrothermal vents. The idea is once you can create some kind of simple inorganic membrane, a bubble, basically, as proposed by um, Mike Russell, you get bubbles of iron sulfide. And iron sulfide also happens to be a great... Um, catalyst for making long chain molecules. You have a bubble basically that does the job of an early cell and you start to get those first reactions um, that create long chain molecules. There's obviously a lot of detail to fill in there but the difference between that and Fred Hoyle is you only, if you're on a very simple level, if you can create a bubble where small molecules can get in but large molecules can't get out, you start to concentrate your um, reactants, if you like, start to concentrate the chemicals in there in a way that you don't in the pond. And so you've got concentrated chemicals with a continuous source of energy because you get this little uh, electrical... Uh, you get this electric field across, you know, across the membrane because of the alkaline vent fluid inside the bubble and the acidic vent fluid outside the bubble. And this little electric field you get it can be used as a way of storing energy mm. or driving reactions. So you start to get, this is what I found exciting about it, you start to get the ingredients that you feel you would need to begin cellular life. 
And that's what we're talking about, isn't it? We're talking about how do you make a bacterium? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's all you need is to make something that can make copies of itself. Yeah. Once that started, Once that's done, you're off to Darwinian the races, evolution basically. just yeah, takes yeah. over and yeah. just gets more and more complicated. It's just yeah. that, that, that first it's that step. That initial, that, that first step. So it happened on Earth. Do, do you then believe that it, therefore, if those conditions must exist of all the hundreds of billions of stars? just in our own galaxy, and so many of them have planets. There must be planets that are the right distance from their star to, to have some liquid water and so on, have all the ingredients. Surely that process will have happened elsewhere as well. That's what I believe, yeah. There's another argument as well, which is that life, that, that kind of life started really early on Earth. I mean, first of all, we now know conditions settled down on Earth much quicker than we originally thought, you know, so that... Um, there was an oxidizing atmosphere. You know, things like carbon dioxide were already in, in the atmosphere very early on. And there was liquid water on the Earth's surface. And then, so the Earth is, you know, roughly 4.5 billion years old. Round about, you know, no one's exactly sure, round about 4 billion years ago, Mark, the Earth is pounded by asteroids. There's this terrible bombardment. I mean, it's, it's bombarded, obviously, since it forms. And it's bombarded, you know, up, up until three billion years ago, but there's a really huge spike in bombardment. And we can tell, we know this, because we can see, we can date the craters on the moon, basically. It's a really a period they called the late heavy bombardment. And life, we think, had begun on Earth before that. So that's really, really early. That's really, really early to get going. Mm. So it's almost like you think single-celled life, to my mind, works pretty much straight out of the box. You know, it's like you've got an Earth-like mm. planet, you've got water on it, it's around a sun-like star, you're going to get single-celled life. It's the other stages that are really, yeah. really tricky. It's getting, it's getting from that to complex life. Nearly all life that's ever existed on Earth is of the single-celled yeah. variety. I mean, bacteria are... They're, they're really kicking our ass. They really are. I mean, they are everywhere. Bacteria mm -hmm. are everywhere. They're the most successful organism on the planet, bar none. And only in one tiny, tiny fraction of organisms did what we call complex multicellularity evolve. Yeah. And of those handful of cases, it's only, it's only animals where we find intelligence. So the odds against intelligent life seem very, very high. Yeah. I mean, in terms of life starting, I guess... What always puzzles me is that so far, and there's no evidence to the contrary, so far it seems to have only started once on Earth. Yes, yeah. You know, because we can tra all life on Earth can be traced back to that first yes. replicator, that, 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 that you could first maybe, thing. You could maybe argue twice, because you could maybe argue that what they call the last universal common ancestor, imagine this, this you know, little pocket of life living in this bubble... Mm arguably left the vent twice because there are really two different kinds of single-celled organisms on the planet, bacteria and the archaea. Mm. And they are very, very different from one another. And there is a school of thought which says that basically they both have a common ancestor, uh, but each evolved a different kind of membrane in order to leave the vent. Right. So... But you're still down to, you know, it's still not yeah. great, is it? <laughs> two, <laughs> two cases. I mean, and, and yeah. really it's one anyway, because it's the same family tree of life. That's a really, why, if life started, this is a great question, yeah. isn't it? If life started way back then, why has it not been starting since? If it started since? so early that it was so easy for it to have started yeah. even, you know, before that late heavy bombardment. Why has it not started why again? Why has it started again? You, in the book, you explore sort of possible other worlds that might be, just right for life, and then you speculate what life would be like. I even wrote this down, because it's very, very good. So what would life on a super-Earth in the habitable zone of an orange dwarf star look like? <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> specific. You've narrowed it down. That, that's where you're going to find your aliens. Yeah, you know? well, this is the really, really exciting thing that I came across, is that, um, and I didn't know this, basically, pretty much as you'd expect, most planets are medium sized the terrestrial planets are pretty small, obviously. The Earth and Mercury, Mars, Venus, are all very, very small planets. Then you've got really big things like Jupiter. And in our own solar system, there's nothing really in between. We've got Neptune, but, you know, there's nothing... 
There's nothing like medium-sized. That, in fact, you get to the big, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, and if there's life there, it's in their moons. It's got to be in their moons, yeah, yeah because their <laughs> moons are more like the size of the terrestrial planets. Right. Yeah. So, turns out, of course, that if you look at all, so you know, put all solar systems up on the wall, up on the wall, all the Kepler, all, all the two thousand, you know, odd solar systems we've found, and you put them all up there, there's a lot of medium-sized stuff that we just don't happen to have in our our solar system. Our solar system mm. is a little not that unusual, but not that common is maybe like one in a hundred, one in a thousand, and uh, to have no medium-sized planets at all. So we don't particularly know why that was. We think maybe it was because Jupiter moved around a lot in the early solar system and kicked a few planets out, mm. kicked the medium-sized stuff out. But really, we should have some medium-sized planets. And um, if you get a really big terrestrial-sized planet, they call that super-Earth. So you're talking about stuff that's like, say, one and a half times the radius of the Earth um, up to something that's sort of half the size of Neptune, if you like. That middle, that's, that's really the sweet spot for planets. It turns out that kind of planet, if it's around a star that is dimmer, slightly dimmer than the sun, could be the absolute perfect place for life for a number of, of really, really great reasons, mostly to do with time. Because as we know, one form of life on this planet, what you clearly need for evolution is a lot of time, Stars that are slightly dimmer than our own sun last a lot longer. You know, our sun lasts, might last, say, 5 billion years. Sorry, 10 billion years. Uh, the uh, K-types might last twice, twice as long. So you've got twice as much time. So maybe you've got 10 billion years instead of the five that we've had where the star is stable and life could form. With these big planets... Once you get a big planet like that, obviously the gravity is much stronger. You don't get huge mountains and uh, deserts. You get much more like a kind of tiny little islands, basically. And we know from life on Earth that tiny little islands and shallow seas are great places for life to evolve. You know, there's not a lot of life in the deep oceans, and there's not a lot of life at the top of mountains. You know, there's, it, most life appears to, you know, uh, going back to... Um, you know, the very first, you know, hard-bodied creatures on Earth, they appeared to have evolved in shallow seas. And that's where you'd have loads of that on super-Earths. So there, that was, I couldn't believe this. You know, not only are there, uh, might there be other Earths out there, there might be more super-Earths than there are Earths. And they could be a better place to evolve life. So it's kind of, it's really, oh, that blew my mind, actually. I thought that was amazing. Do you think in your heart of hearts that, you know, in your lifetime we will discover... We're not likely to... I mean, it's not so likely we're going to discover, uh, hear a signal from some alien civilization. It's more likely that we're going to find some mi microbial life somewhere. Do you think that is likely? Because uh, even yeah. that would, would be the, one of the greatest discoveries in the whole of science. I, I, feel, I feel like, yeah, within, within, a, within a decade, I think we'll have a disputed signal. One of the things, you look at the atmosphere of a planet, even if you can't go there, you use the... You know, boop, the barcode, you can see what the gases are in the atmosphere. And if you've got oxidizing gases and you've got a reducing gas there present, you know there's a chemical, you know something's not right, something's going on. Like on Earth, we keep, you know, there's, you know, you've got plants pumping out oxygen all the time. Oxygen couldn't exist uh, in balance with all the other gases that there are in the atmosphere without life continually recycling it and pumping it out. You can see that there's a chemical imbalance. You know that there must be something going on, you know, and that, that thing could be life. I really, I think there's, I'd be amazed if there isn't microbial life on Mars. I just think it's... Because we've been yeah. there before, right? Yeah. In, in the 90s, yeah, we, have. we thought we'd discovered yeah, microbial yeah. life. It turns out that... Twice now, we thought we'd discovered yeah. it. Once with the, with the lander. Yes. A liking lander that thought, thought we'd find uh, Martian microbes. Yeah. And the second time with the meteorites, you know, the Allen Hills meteorites. Mm. I mean, a lot of biologists say the the fossils are just too small to be life, but, you know, too small to be the kind of life we find on Earth. Well, that's right. It's, it's yeah. too small to, to have enough room for enough DNA to... Yeah. to but who, to says, they, who and... says that life, Martian life is using DNA? Do you know yeah, what I mean? It's a yeah, kind yeah. of odd... It's an odd uh, yardstick that we're applying, isn't we it? We do uh, uh, not just think that all life should be like life on Earth, but we even anthropomorphise yeah. aliens, you <laughs> yeah. know? Yeah. And yeah. that they should have intelligence like us, and they'd be yeah. able to, we'd be able to talk to them. And, uh, yeah. Although there are good... What I, that was the other thing, is that if there is 
uh, complex multicellular life out there, there are good arguments to suggest that the same things that evolved on Earth, like teeth and eyes and intelligence and civilization, would evolve there. Because mm. there's two things going on here. We sort of assume everything is like, uh, is like life on Earth, but at the same time, we want to, res we want to think that we humans are incredibly special. special. And that was another thing that I learned as well going, was that um, things like civilization um, have been going for about eight million years in, in uh, a certain kind of Brazilian ant, which I hadn't realized. <laughs> um, uh, that intel the octopuses show... They developed nuclear fusion and everything yeah, yeah. by now. <laughs> <laughs> They're ripping off my book right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, that um, we're, we're an accidental hero, really, uh, mm. homo sapiens. These things all just happen to, f to fall at the same time, you know. Mm. And also, we were a nasty lot, you know. We wiped out anything else that was a, was a rival to us, you know. It's very mm. interesting. I was thinking, I think about this only this morning, when I was reading a storybook to my son, and my, I've got a four-year-old son, and he's very focused on um, goodies and baddies. You know, are you a goodie and a bad, or are you a baddie? And... Um, to a certain extent, it's what all our stories are about. You're either with us or you're not with us and we're going mm -hmm. to destroy you because we're good and you're bad. We're murderous. We're a murderous species. It's just a terrifying thing. You look at human, his you know, human history and these other incredible creatures. You know, like the, it's, it's, we know of one for certain that lived alongside us, but many, many more mm. in, in Africa. Very, si very similar to us that we just clearly either uh, outcompeted or more likely mm -hmm. just destroyed. You know, when you see what we do to, us, what we do yeah. to ourselves and other cultures, uh, even other human cultures on Earth that we decide that we take against and we're good and they're evil and we're going to wipe them out. You know? And we so project that onto sort of aliens. We project either, that they they either aliens, want to destroy yeah. the Earth or they're enlightened, they want to teach us stuff. Yeah. We never take into account they might just be indifferent and don't, yeah. we just really, <laughs> really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but, but listen, Ben, look, well, I'd, yes. I'd, I'd, I'd stop talking to you. I think we've, how are we doing for time? We'd, look at that, perfect. Uh, so if we could have the house lights up and, and, and roving mics and maybe open it up to the audience. To, yes, to please. Yes. Given that they haven't the advantage that I have in, 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 in that I've read the book, but I'm sure they have plenty of questions to ask you. Chap there, the third row, and then, and then yes, 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 you who's looking behind you, it is you. We're, you, you, can, you can go next. Go ahead. Yeah, is it true you can really talk to crows? Because I watched Would I Lie to You quite recently. And ah. Is it true? <coughs> it is absolutely true uh, that you can talk to crows. They won't necessarily understand much of what you're saying. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was saying, well, you know, funnily enough, we think we're unique in so many ways, but corvids, the family to which crows belong, They've developed the same kind of problem-solving intelligence that we have. And Is that the theory of mind? The, the, they have theory of, of mind. Where so of they're themselves. able to... Is there a series of experiments. My favourite is um, the Crow Motel. Do you know this one? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're laughing. I don't know what that yeah. means. They know about it or they just don't believe you. are just going to make stuff up. A couple of people have stayed in it. Think, <laughs> but the, uh, the Crow Motel, we have three rooms, okay... So there's a, um, essentially there's the lobby and there's bedroom, there's bedroom one and bedroom two. So uh, if they go to sleep in bedroom one, they get breakfast in the morning. They go to sleep in bed, bedroom two, no breakfast in the morning. So what the, what the crows do, if you the crows are great at sort of hiding and caching food. It's one of the things, one of their behaviours that the they really exploit in all these experiments. So basically, what they did was then, after establishing this, so the crow goes, oh, right, bedroom one, breakfast, bedroom two, no breakfast. They give the crow some food during the day. The crow would go and hide the food in the room where it wouldn't get breakfast. <laughs> in other words, it was not only do crows have a theory of mind in that they, they are um, capable of hiding food from other crows. They are dis capable of deceiving other crows. Mm -hmm. But they also have mental time travel. They're capable of, they're capable of thinking, 
Okay, well, I'm going to know that one tonight, so and I've got a couple of hazelnuts here. So They are capable of thinking into the future and placing themselves in the future and anticipating future behaviour, which is not something, at one stage, anyone thought that uh, animals, particularly crows, were, were capable of doing. And there's been a similar suite of experiments that were done on chimpanzees, and it's really interesting that they see, that they see a lot of parallels between crow intelligence and chimpanzee intelligence and if anything the, cr- the crows come out slightly ahead <laughs> it is incredible yeah and, and the idea of talking to you mentioned talking to crows talking so yeah there's, so there's the talking to, to, to talking dolphins. to crows so i went to meet this professor nikki clayton um she has uh she absolutely loves she's just totally in love with uh crows these northern scrub jays that she uses, uh, does these sort of psych experiments on. And she does talk to them, and they recognise her. And she could explain to me, when the crow, she would call this crow, the crow would come over, and one basic thing I hadn't realised about crow behaviour is I always thought, when a crow sort of does that, it's actually looking at the person here. Mm. So you kind of think, (laughs) you think they're daft, because you're sort of standing there, and they're going... (laughs) (laughs) But actually, they're... They're really giving you the beady eye, just you just don't know it. And it was really interesting, just a few keys to crow behaviour, and you suddenly start to see how intelligent they are and that they're communicating with one another. And, she, and Nikki was explaining to me, now they're telling, now he's telling the other crows that you're here and he doesn't recognise you, that I'm here, and now he's telling... And then you could see the other crows sort of going, is he, what does he look like? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I recognise him. <laughs> anyway, our obsession with language is 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 fascinating, and again, it's the way we try and sort of impose our own ideas of how you should communicate on other intelligent creatures on our own planet. What SETI, um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, when it was first founded in the very early '60s, they did a number of experiments on dolphins where they tried to teach dolphins to speak English. <laughs> in fact, one researcher filled, um, they had a, um, a kind of a little uh, dolphin sort of reserve. They filled a house with water and she cohabited with a dolphin to spend, a, because she felt that a bit like, there was some theory behind this. There was a, an idea that um, children at the time, in the 60s, it was believed that children learned to speak through immersive contact with mm. a mother. That was how we now know that that's not the way that language is acquired, that it's more sort of hardwired than that. But it was believed at the time, immersive contact with a mother was how all of us picked up our language. And they believed, well, OK, we need immersive contact between a dolphin and a, a mother figure. She sort of painted lipstick on her lips so she could, uh, the dolphin could see the shape her lips was making. Uh, and she attempted to teach the dolphin to use its blowhole to speak English. Um, and and um, it didn't work, obviously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that didn't... Uh, the fact... The fact that it didn't work was not immediately apparent to the researchers. They, they really believed that they were making progress and this dolphin was learning mm. to speak English. It's a kind of um, cautionary tale in <laughs> some ways. Um, there's a happier... Well, not, not a conclusion, not a happy conclusion to that story, but um, SETI are currently... Many people in SETI are now doing really great research on dolphin language. And there's a fantastic SETI researcher called Lawrence Doyle who is using um, maths, basically. He's using the maths of language to show that dolphin whistles have the mathematical properties that that human language has. So it's not proof that dolphins have a language to communicate with one another, but it's um, certainly encouraging. You know, mm. fascinating. Yes. Hi, Ben. Um, you mentioned that you hope to see some kind of signal over the next 10 years of alien life to, uh, for us to receive some kind of signal. Yeah. Um, and that would be great. That would be brilliant. But at least for now, we have no confirmed proof of alien life. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard of what's called the, the Fermi paradox, which can be broadly summarized as if intelligent mm-hmm. life does exist, then where are they? 
Uh, and there are a lot of answers to this, whether it be that the distances involved are just too great. Maybe, as we've talked about today, the conditions required for life are just too difficult. Um, what's your take on this and what do you think is the most likely answer? Um, well, in terms of signal, I mean, to be specific, what I'm talking about is picking up the spectra of uh, the gases in, an a in, in the atmosphere of an alien planet and to be able to say, for example, there's, that oxygen is out of, you know, there shouldn't be oxygen on that planet. It would be out of chemical balance with the other gases that are there. Something must be driving that atmosphere. Life is one of the things that possibly drives it. I think we should keep looking. And the search is certainly hotting up. You know, I mean, we're going to search uh, the nearest million sun-like stars within the next decade. I mean, even if you sort of roughly do the numbers on how many alien civilizations you might hope there would be, you probably need to search more like 10 or 100 million stars before you find a signal. But still, searching a million is a decent fraction. We, we're sort of getting somewhere. This isn't uh, mm. uh, 10,000 or 100,000 anymore. This is a, de a decent fraction of the number that we would need to search. The Fermi paradox is basically, as, as you said, if aliens exist, intelligent aliens exist, where are they? Where are all the aliens? You know, surely they should be here by now. And there have been some great calculations done by Paul Davis that shows um, you really don't need to... Sp intelligent life really wouldn't need to spread that quickly throughout a galaxy uh, in order to um, populate it. You know, I mean, it's talking, you're talking of the order of millions of years for intelligent life to populate a galaxy. So where are they? Um, my um, answer to that is that I believe it to be a timing, a timing problem. Civilizations don't last that long. Civilizations that use the same technology as, as us are rare. Intelligent life is rare in itself. If the lights go on on this planet over here, they've gone out by the time the lights go on on this planet over there. You know, I mean, we've, you know, in, in cosmic terms, the 50 or so years that we've been, um, well, I suppose 100 years that the planet's been lit up, but, you know, 50 years or so we've been broadcasting electromagnetic signals of a decent strength. But is that because you think, you know, civilizations will ultimately just destroy themselves or they will evolve I beyond they, the physical I need to send signals to each other? I just think they evolve. Technology is just, you know, it was the, it's not the civil... I don't believe it's that civilizations <coughs> fall. I think it's just technologies are very, very short-lived. You know, we're already, you know, arguably, we're already into a third phase of, of technology in, in our own communication. We started with you know, just splurging radio um, waves into the sky, didn't we? And then we went to cable. We, cable's not, not very detectable from space, you know. Mm. So we, we were bright, you know, in terms of electromagnetic signals, bright for probably only, what, what was it by the time we started cables? Probably in the 80s, 90s. Mm. If, you, if you count sort of beginning in the late 30s as the first really strong radio signals and it had gone by the late 80s, 50 years, that's not a long time. And now, arguably... We're sort of moving over to optical. You know, we're tending to use lasers more to, mm. for our uh, really long-distance communication. So, you know, now, now the aliens have got to start looking for lasers. Um, that's probably <laughs> going to la last 50 years, and there'll be something else we'll be using, you know. I mean, 50 years, you know, that was a very, that was a very, very short window, you know, when it's, it's probably a lot further than 50 light years to the nearest civilization. Mm. You know, it, it's a timing. It's a timing thing, I think. The Paul Davis argument that they should have been here and there, you know, they would have populated the galaxies. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. Distance between solar systems is so unimaginably large. I think that's a, that's a real problem. I think travelling within a solar system, and we, we've done it ourselves, but I think they're out there. It's just a timing thing. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? We show up with the red carnation. We go... Not, not, not no. coming. <laughs> a crow looks at us. <laughs> decides against it. We, we, we head off. Then an alien shows up with a red carnation. It's, like it's, just, it's just timing, I think. Missing each other. Yeah. <laughs> OK, let's have some more questions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned before about us making assumptions, like they, the, you, you talk about the size of the holes on the meteor and saying about the DNA, assuming that it would be a DNA-based life, and it may not be. Have they done any work into what other forms life might take if it's not sort of DNA, carbon-based? Are, are there other forms it could take? And have they... Looked into that? Yeah, well, I mean, yes, lots. I mean, DNA really uh, chemically looks very like two strands of RNA sort of fused together. 
you know, basically, if, if the cell is a kitchen, RNA is the chef and DNA is the cookbook. You know, it's RNA that does all the, all the work. We already know there was another kind of life before ours, arguably RNA-type life. That's, that's life, but nothing, not necessarily as we would rec recognize it, with a, maybe a different suite of long-chain molecules involved. But, but RNA, the, the prime suspect, would have been there. There's a, it's amazing work being done with... I mean, Craig Venter, all kinds of people doing amazing work. They take DNA and they try and attach, um, they try and alter it. You know, so we're taking the basic template of DNA and messing around with it. They can make artificial kinds of DNA and they've done that. The assumption that everyone is making is just that it would be, you need a reasonably long chain molecule because it's got to carry a lot of information and it's got to be able to make copies of itself. That's basically, as far as we've got, there's no... You know, there's nothing to say. It has to be RNA. I people, don't you know, think. People forget that, don't they? It's not yeah. just the, the, the complexity of the structure of the building blocks of life. It's the fact that it needs to be able to hold information, yeah. instruction manual to make, to make life. To, you know, and, and so yeah. It's that it's uh, the amount of information the, the, it needs the, to contain. The, the, the coding it? aspect of it, the yeah. software, is, is needed as well for life. Yeah. Good. We have, one quest well, we have two questions up, up there. Then Ooh. we'll come... There's a gentleman over there. Yeah. This question actually comes from the OCR physics GCSE that was sat last year. Um, ah. Huh? Huh? <laughs> so you great, better guys. be able to answer it. <laughs> Love you. Buy the book. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, good. Looking forward it, to this. It was, do we, should we send out um, signals to aliens? And I'll just say most of the people I talked to who sat it said that they said no because they might attack us. I think that's a little bleak. <laughs> um, I, first of all, we are sending them out anyway, so I don't think we need to really worry about that. That balloon, you know, that ever-expanding sphere of radio waves is, is out there. Admittedly, it's not that strong, but it's, but it's out there. Um, so certainly anything probably within, within a few tens of light years of the Earth already... Already knows, already knows about us anyway, and they're the only ones close enough to do any real damage, surely. So it's, <laughs> it's already over, I think, as far as if, uh, if they're going to come and get us. But no, I think we should send signals. In fact, when you get into, get, uh, get into information theory a little bit in the, um, in the book, and you know, what becomes apparent really, really quickly is there's no, not much point sending a message. You just, gotta send, just, you just need to send a lot of just a lot of data. You've got to send a lot of stuff because the chances of ever being able to uh, decode or make any sense of it is, um, is slim. So the more you've got to work on, the better. I think what we send should be honest. Uh, Seth Shostak um, one, uh, of SETI has a really great argument uh, where he says we should just send the entire internet. <laughs> um, obviously not my stuff yeah, um, no, that's <laughs> mainly yours but uh, but yeah the idea being you know we should just you know here we are this is us you know warts and all I've got some old pictures on Facebook where I'd had a few bit too much to drink and I <laughs> would, would rather not a aliens <laughs> yeah. saw that yeah but yes I think we should yeah there was another question um, I think it was you had your hand up didn't you yes um, you touched on like Darwinism earlier, and what do you think would be the actual impact tomorrow if we discovered, well, if we came in contact with intelligent life or like bacterial, like what realistically would we all freak out or like? Weirdly, I don't think we would freak out. Actually, I mean, I think you kind of think back to sort of other momentous. It's sort of news, isn't it, for about a week. Um, <laughs> And then I think it will blow over. It would be the Big Brother house again, wouldn't it? It will all blow over. <laughs> Basically, we have been in that situation before. We have been in a situation, you know, where people said, you know, I can see canals on Mars. I think there's aliens up there. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think we've, we've found them. I think we're in. We've got them. We've got the aliens. And it blew over. You know, I mean, it's sort of, I think we'd find it, we would digest it culturally and spiritually fairly rapidly, I think. Yeah. Of course, it depends, you know, uh, if, if it's openly hostile. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, 
and it's coming to get us. <laughs> Don't worry about that, seriously. Uh, then maybe it might be different. But, yeah. but the very existence of it, you know, say we find oxygen on a nearby sun, you know, uh, on a nearby, on a super Earth orbiting a K type star, um, you know, whatever, 30, 30 light years away. I don't think anyone's going to. No, I don't think anyone's going to throw their toys out of the pram. Thanks for listening and join us in two weeks' time when Anita Sengupta from NASA will tell us about landing the Curiosity rover on Mars. <laughs>